Okay. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for tuning in to another Risk Institute online session. Today, we're fortunate to have with us one of our uh, alumni and good friends, Dr. Hindalo George Williams, now at De Montfort University in Leicester. He's going to talk to us about his research on um, techno-economic assessment of smart energy hubs for electrical vehicle charging. The presentation will be around 45 minutes and 20 to 30 minutes for Q&A. Uh, so if you can make sure your mics are muted and leave any questions in the chat and uh, we'll address them at the end of the talk. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Hindalo George Williams. And as I'm sure many of you know who he is and I've already met him before. Um, he's now a lecturer in energy engineering at the Institute of Energy and Sustainable Development in De Montfort University. He holds a dual PhD in engineering from the Institute for Risk Uncertainty uh, and Nuclear Engineering from the College of Nuclear Science, National Tsing Hua University in Taiwan. Hopefully I said that correctly. Yeah. Previously, he was a power systems research engineer in the electrical power group uh, at Newcastle University from where he joined Oxford University's energy and power group as a postdoctoral researcher in energy systems. At Newcastle, he worked on the UK's first large scale solar powered electrical uh, electric vehicle charging demonstrator project funded by Innovate UK. And his research interests include reliability and resilience of power systems, low cost smart grids in low income countries, smart electric vehicle charging power systems, stochastic optimization. So he's clearly been very busy since he's uh, left us a couple of years ago. Um, do you have anything else that you'd like to add, Hindalo? Okay, yep, maybe I'll just start share of my share my screen just bear with me and let's stop sharing yeah there you go okay. the floor is yours yeah good thanks francis well the only thing to add would be i am really happy to be here right it's been it's been a while it's been you know a lot has happened good and so bad as you all know well it's good to be back even though it's it's only virtually. So just to provide <clears throat> a bit of background uh, to this presentation, I started this research at Newcastle University uh, when I joined them in 2018 as a power systems <clears throat> research engineer, which was really as part of a knowledge transfer partnership for those who do not know. Uh, a knowledge transfer partnership is normally a three-way partnership between Innovate UK, uh, a UK-based SME and a university. And the purpose is to help the SME, well, develop innovative solutions that are, well, that can be commercialized. So when I joined Newcastle and uh, Flexi Solar, which, which was the SME, they had just won a funding from Innovate UK to build demonstrator sites for electric for rapid electric vehicle charging. And my role then as power systems research engineer was to crunch the numbers, right? So I was charged with the responsibility of you know of determining how, well how financially viable. Uh, the technology was and well, general uh, reliability of the technology and overall performance. Okay, but why did Innovate UK fund uh, that research or similar uh, you know, research going on now? The answer is really simple, right? It's, you know, it's, it's very, very simple. Even though uh, a certain ex-president says, climate change is, is a hoax. But we all know that it's not, right? So if you if you look around, the, the manifestations are, are all around us. You know, the, the forest fires in, in Australia, the extra cold winters in, in the US, the drought in East Africa, and flooding in Europe. You know, these are real uh, manifestations of climate change. And it's, attributable to our activities. The chart you see here uh, is CO2 emission by economic sector, okay? And you can see that energy accounts for 73.2 years. So this actually includes a building energy, transportation, but energy generation and consumption as a whole. So which means if 
theoretically, if we can reduce our, 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 our emission, right, from, from energy generation and, and consumption, we would have been able to more or less tackle climate change. Okay, but this is not possible. We, we, we really can't reduce this to zero. So what we can do is we can reduce the carbon emission from, from uh, our energy generation and consumption activities, and then remove the, you know, what's left, okay? And that sort of uh, approach is really the, the, the foundation of net zero. So net zero just means our carbon removal and emission are, are, are equal. So how do we reduce our carbon emission? It's, it's quite straightforward, right? So we revert to renewable energy and electrify transport, okay? Carbon removal, we can plant a lot of trees or you know, uh, use carbon capture and storage technology. So <clears throat> as countries commit, right, to the, well, say commit also to net zero, you will see that uh, most countries have opted to, to electrify transportation, okay? And the UK is one example, Scotland, Norway, and most of the developed countries, okay? So what will happen is that uh, we will begin to see uh, diesel and petrol stations being replaced by electric forecasts because, right, you need a charging infrastructure to support this revolution, okay? And because our energy system is still not carbon neutral, we are still, like the UK, we have about 37 to, yeah, 37 or so roughly because it fluctuates percent uh, <coughs> of renewables. So it doesn't make much sense to, you know, to, to, to power electric vehicles using uh, the conventional grid, even though that's what we are doing now because we have no option. So you see that most forecasts adopt uh, solar so that they can try as possible, you know, as possible to, to remove the carbon content of the electricity they sell to vehicles. So what is a smart hub, right? So a smart hub is just a grid connected forecourt that has, of course, solar and a number of electric vehicle charging stations, okay? So when this concept was initially conceived by Newcastle University and, uh, and, and Flexis Solar, the idea was to have only rapid chargers, okay? And rapid charging currently uh, <clears throat> happens via DC, okay? You don't use AC. So that's why you can see that we have both <clears throat> AC and DC, in fact, you have more DC, uh, well, you have more use for DC than AC really, okay? And that's supported by the fact that solar panels generate DC directly. The batteries are in, in actual sense, uh, actually powered by, were charged by DC. The hydrogen generation also uses DC. So the idea was if, we just use DC converters. We don't have to do multiple conversions. You know, as most systems do, you convert the solar AC, I mean, DC to AC. And when you get here, you convert from DC to AC. So lots of losses, right? <clears throat> okay. But on the same side, you may have off the shelf chargers. Just, these are just chargers that we, I mean, electric chargers on the market, right? And these are AC powered. So these are normally on the side of the inverter. The energy management system is, you know, the purpose of the energy management system is to really control, okay? To control the entire operation of this system, okay? You know, subject to certain objectives, but the main objective here as you will learn later will be cost, cost, <clears throat> cost minimization or revenue maximization. Good. So there are a number of uh, you know, uh, benefits of 
the smart hub, right? So one easy and you know uh, easily understood benefit is range ag- range anxiety. It alleviates range anxiety. Okay, what range anxiety means here is that the fear of running out of charge before you complete your trip. It also reduces grid capacity congestion because you're using uh, solar power to charge electric vehicles, right? Which means if you didn't have that, that load would have uh, been powered by by the by the grid. But most importantly, and and one benefit that is not easily uh, deducible unless you're really an expert here is <laughs> sorry, God, uh, yes, uh, sorry, I have a presentation. Oh, uh, yeah, so, yeah, sorry, I, I didn't tell you. Oh, okay, okay. okay. So that's okay then. Now I'll come back in for three minutes. Uh-huh. How much time? Maybe 30 as well. 30 yeah, but if you can say that as long as you're not too bothered by. I'm not bothered actually. Okay, well, it's fine. Yes, yeah, you can yeah, say as long as you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, my, my, my colleague just came in. So, okay. So, okay. So, um, one. Other benefit is really improving grid stability, right? So you can see that a smart hub normally houses a number of vehicles, okay? And each of these vehicles has uh, has a battery storage system, okay? So if you aggregate all these batteries, you really have a very large storage system at, you know, say at any time okay you know packed at a smart hub site and the opportunity this presents is that you can store electricity in there like okay and you can discharge it back into the grid so one application of that is frequency response okay frequency response is just it's just trying to match um, well to keep the frequency of the grid at well at 50 has plus or minus 1%, okay? So when the frequency exceeds that range, you you sort of want to dump, right? Some uh, some of the power from the grid into, into a storage. And when, the, when you have too much uh, load on the grid, you want to get back that energy stored in those batteries. So that, whole process keeps the grid really stable. However, the, the operation of a smart hub is, is, is really characterized by a number of uh, technical and economic considerations, right? So there are a number of questions you need to answer. So one possible question is, right, you want to know how reliable and safe is, is the system. You want to know a bit about the optimal sizing. How do you size? Uh, these components optimally. You want to know about the feasibility of DC only charging. Economically, you want to know how profitable your venture is. Is it really because let's not fool ourselves, right? The whole the whole goal here is you want to make money as well because that's what makes your system sustainable. Okay, you want to know could this current solution be cheaper? What strategy maximizes gains? And how are these gains affected by external dynamics, say inflation, the uptake of electric vehicles, and, and the rest? You need to know this. You need to be able to answer these questions, OK? These questions are somewhat related as well, as you can see, because the profitability of the project depends on you know, the reliability of components, actually or the optimal sizing, are you really, did you really size the system optimal, okay? And the truth is to answer these questions is really hard. It's not, it's not easy, it's not straightforward, okay? And because of a whole number of points, so intermittent solar energy generation, uncertainties in electric vehicle charging parameters, correlations in electric vehicle charging parameters. So these three, uh, uh, I'll say challenges, makes the whole process really challenging, okay? So let's look a bit into the uncertainties, 
you can come across in a, in a, in a typical smart hub, okay? So there is uncertainty in driver preference. Okay, so driver preference here really uh, encompasses a whole lot of considerations listed. So you want to know, will the vehicle be available for V2G? V2G here just means vehicle to, to grid, meaning <clears throat> whilst the vehicle is being charged, assuming you need to discharge some of the energy in the battery, maybe back in, into the grid or maybe to use it to charge another vehicle, okay? The driver of that vehicle has to be willing to, to do that, okay? Maximum allowable cycling of vehicle battery because the, the number of cycles you put a battery through determines the lifespan of the battery. Some drivers may, may, may say, okay, I don't want you cycling my battery above this limit, okay? Rapid DC charging or, or slower AC charging because you can either charge a vehicle via AC or DC, but whilst one is rapid, like DC is normally maybe 50 and above or so, and you can charge most vehicles maybe in 30 minutes or so, that's fine. AC is, is a lot slower, so that takes time. Time spent by the driver of the site, how long are they going to stay at that site? Do they want to stay for two hours? Because that definitely determines what charging strategy you need to use because at the end of the day, they want to leave the site with their battery full or at least with enough charge to complete their next trip. Desired minimum final state of charge. That's what I was saying exactly. How much charge do they need for their next trip? Again, will the driver refuse to charge if their preferred charger is unavailable? Say, let's say I turn to, I mean, you know, I turn up and I really want to a rapid char charge my vehicle and you tell me oh all all rapid chargers are engaged okay so if the driver will stay then that has another effect on on the performance of the site there is also an uncertainty in other parameters say the number of vehicles arriving at a site in a period or the vehicle suit of charge on arrival what you know are they empty or are they near full or are they half full so these are you know these are some of the uncertainties right there is also a correlation here okay so there's a correlation actually among uh, a number of quantities vehicle type and effective ch charging speed right however still of charge their time spent at the side and minimum deserve. so these we will actually look at later Okay, so okay, so okay, good. I want to see. Okay, good. So before we we go into the details of of the proposed framework, uh, there's just a bit of uh, housekeeping here that that I want to go through so that you understand some of the concepts we we'll discuss later, okay? So if you see an A here means this is an assumption, meaning it's not necessarily true, but they use them. Okay, so the first assumption here we made about the model was charge points are controllable, okay? So which means you can vary their charge discharge. Of course, this is true, but it's not true for all chargers. There are some chargers you don't, you can't remotely control them. We also have assumed that charge points have, well, say they are the most charge points are dual, which means they have an AC and DC charging. You can actually choose which one to use, but you can only use one at a time. Okay. But the good thing to the, the important thing to note here is that once a vehicle decides to charge via AC, you cannot use it for vehicle to grid charging. And this is a current, this is actually these are hardware limitation. So current vehicles or current vehicles can only uh, be discharged via DC. Then there are two charging principles, okay, or two charging strategies currently used. So we have uncontrolled charging. As the name, as the name implies, when the vehicle turns up to the site and it's connected, you charge it at the maximum rate possible. So if this vehicle accepts 50 kilowatt, you just charge it at that rate. You cannot vary it. So that's uncontrolled charging. And this means because you cannot control it, you cannot use it for V2G. Controlled charging for me is the 
is the power of the electric vehicle. Okay, so here you can actually decide when to charge or discharge your vehicle or at what rate you want to go low, do you want to go high, you know, depending on what you want. And in this case, you can use it for V2G. Okay, then we also assume that there is a charge point booking system in place here. Okay, so this is a little bit conservative. Okay, and what, what this means is that we assume that we know the number of vehicles coming to the site in each time slot for this. So let's say we divide a day in a turn into, into 48 times, slot, so 30 minutes each. Okay. So this is called day ahead planning, but we need it to sort of simplify the problem a bit because it's based on simulation, okay? Good. So this is an architecture of the framework, okay? It's, it's, it's a simulation-based framework because looking at the, the complexities here, the operational complexities and the uncertainties, it, it will be really difficult to to use uh, a deterministic uh, uh, model, okay? So we opted for a Monte Carlo because we wanted to build a complete model of, of a smart hub to allow us to actually replicate its operating strategy, okay? So there are two stages in the model. The first stage is what those the simulation, it, it, it actually replicates the behavior of the site, okay? And in this stage, this stage, well, sort of has two sub stages. The first sub stage generates the random, okay? Randomly generates based on the inputs, of course, the ensemble of vehicles coming to the site and assigns them to a charge point, okay? Then it sends this record to the to the energy management algorithm. So the energy man management algorithm is actually is, is what computes the optimal power flow at the site. Okay. The second stage uses the annual net revenues from the site, from the obtained from the simulation, and the battery usage statistics. The battery usage statistics just lets the model determine how many times the battery will be replaced because the replacement interval of a battery really depends on how much you use the, the battery, how much you charge and discharge it. Okay, so the second stage takes this and computes the net present value or just does the net present value analysis. And what this means is that it calculates the payback period, internal rate of return, return on investment, and any other economic uh, indicator. So this is the full algorithm. I know it could be scary, so I have no intention of going through the entire thing, but I just want to highlight a key, I mean, some, some key points. Okay, so I uh, <clears throat> don't know if I said this on the previous slide, but you, we need to simulate the model for each day Okay, for each day of the projects. These projects are normally 25 to 30 years. Okay, so, so for each day of that period, of the 30 years period, we have to assume, we have to actually compute how the system behaves and the energy flows. Okay, so the first loop is, of course, days, the second loop is years. However, this could be computationally expensive. So you really don't have to do this for every day. Okay, you could, one way you could do this is say, take the average day of each year. So say year one, year 25. So take the average day and do your simulation for just those days. Or you could do it even seasonally. So in that case, there'll be four days in a year. Okay. The other point to note is that between years, we sort of really modify the input data to account for annual inflation, PV module degradation, because the, the PV modules are not, we were, their, their performance is not fixed. It degrades annually. The site battery capacity fading, the site battery as well, the capacity is not fixed, so it fades with time, and these need to be accounted for. 
okay, if you want the simulation to be really uh, realistic, okay? And also that we, there's, there's, there's also uh, a difference in how the battery replacement cost is dealt with, okay? It depends on whether the battery is leased or is bought outright. If the battery is leased, then uh, what we did was we, we included the, the lease payment into the daily operational cost of the system. So which means this is accounted for by the objective function. However, if it's bought, okay, so which means if it's leased, so at this stage, you just set the, set the, set the battery cost to, to zero because that is accounted for by the net revenue. However, if it's bought outright, then uh, it, it needs to be added, okay? And again, because this is a Monte Carlo simulation, so we need to do it for, for a number of times. So again, there are two ways here. You could either do it for a fixed, okay? Say a fixed number of samples, or you could do it for say, okay, you could say, I want the threshold uncertainty to be maybe uh, 5%, okay? And once that's, that's achieved, you stop. So that's just basically what happens. <clears throat> but how does this model compare really to existing models? Okay, so you can see here that I, I've listed, I've listed number, I don't know, seven or so uh, key points. And these points are just really uh, key features of a smart hub. Some other differences are more qualitative, so I, I couldn't put them here. Like none of the systems analyzed before really can be described as hubs. They are similar, but smart hubs are a sort of a new, a new paradigm. So they are different. Secondly, a complete model of a smart hub like this that considers the uncertainties, correlations, I mean, it doesn't, doesn't exist currently. Okay, so, uh, but you can see here that, you know, I, I, these, these five points are really where the model clearly stands out. And I've been a little actually generous in, 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 in assigning uh, ticks. So even when, so even where another model just partially satisfies, uh, you know, uh, a certain feature, you know, I give them the benefit of your doubt and, and, and just put a tick. But even with that, you could see that there's, there's a vast difference so how did we model the uncertainties really? How, how, how did we do it? So we've used a combination of discrete continuous and point probability estimates, okay? Depending on, on the feature being modeled. So for example, the number, of <clears throat> the number of charge point bookings per time slot or the number of vehicles arriving at a site in a certain time slot, you know, was modeled as, as a, uh, as a discrete probability distribution, I will talk about that later. The cont okay, so the state of charge of the vehicle on arrival, the minimum desired final state of charge and the time spent at the site, these, you know, due to their very nature, were modeled as uh, continuous probability estimates, where, whereas driver preference and the likelihood of each EV model, because there are, there are a lot of EV models, okay? So what we did was assign, say, for, for, for a particular site, let's say a fleet management site, the operator could assign the likelihood of each vehicle model turning up to the site. And this could just be the proportion of that model in, in the fleet, okay? So these were just modeled as point probability estimates. So the charge point booking was modeled as a person distribution. Okay, so which means there'll be one distribution for each time slot. Normally it's 48 time slots because uh, the settlement period for electricity in the UK is 30 minutes. So, so most 
analysis, such analysis are normally done at 30 minute intervals, but you could use any interval, of course. And the reason why you use the Poisson is that, of course, it's, 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 it's appropriate for modeling the number of occurrences of a memoryless event in a fixed interval. But in our case, what this implies is that when people book, you know, they, it, it's like a blind booking, right? So they don't know how many people have booked for that. So because if someone knows, there's a likelihood that it could affect the number of people booking for that slot. So that's, that's the caveat there. Besides, okay, we, we compared, uh, you know, some literature and, you know, a few researchers have, do have done uh, statistical experiments on actual data sets before, and uh, they also, that actually, their, their findings actually conforms with this, with this uh, assumption. So that was good there. So, and, uh, the initial and final states of charge, these were both model as better distributions, of course, because the states of charge is between zero and 100, or zero and one, as, as you'd imagine. So uh, that could best be modeled as a better distribution. And what that means also is that during simulation, you, you don't really need to uh, truncate, okay, because any sample you generate will definitely be between zero and one, which is good. Most other researchers used other distributions, but then they needed to, to truncate. Okay, this plot is just a sample distribution for the final, for the minimum final SOC for a sample site. Of course, you would expect people to want their vehicle almost fully charged. So uh, it's, it's, it's sort of, uh, <clears throat> skews to the right, and it depends really. It, it depends on the on the driver's journey requirements. So, then the time spent at a site. Again, we mo we we model this as a gamma distribution, and the reason being, of course, one reason being because we we have assumed that the arrival and departure are person events, so the gamma distribution is appropriate for that for the waiting times between person events. But most importantly, uh, the gamma distribution is, is somewhat general. You could use it to, 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 uh, to model a number of skewed distributions, really. Okay. Okay, so we we grouped the uncertainty in the in the in the initial state of charge of vehicles according to their type and uh, charging rate. Okay, this actually was not based on any experiment, but you would expect, for example, if you take a hybrid vehicle, a hybrid vehicle uses, of course, electric and uh, well, electricity and, and, and maybe diesel or petrol or so. So uh, it means the driver could sometimes afford, right, to to not turn up to the charging station unless their vehicle is really, really almost out of charge. And we also think that a similar behavior could be replicated by, you know, could be exhibited by, you know, by maybe slowly charged or fast charge or rapid charge because, for example, rapid charge vehicles, someone knows that, okay, in 30 minutes I could have, I can have my vehicle charged in 30 minutes, so that's fine. Okay, so uh, based on that, we group these. However, I would like to point out that this sort of depends really on the, on the use case, because if you take an office setting, for example, where you have to go to work every day, regardless of what vehicle you use, or maybe you're not too far off from, from, your, from your office, or it doesn't matter, but it's always good to, to sort of consider these possibilities. We did a similar grouping for the time spent by, by the vehicle, at the site, the same grouping. So, but there is a correlation, as we said earlier, between the initial state of charge, because the minimum final state of charge of the vehicle and its effective charging rate. And of course, the battery capacity. However, the battery capacity really does not play a key role here. Okay, but the three highlighted uh, uh, parameters could be really important and we need to account for these during the simulation. 
So the correlation between the time spent and the effective charging rate has already been accounted for by this grouping. So that's fine. So which means we now need to be able to account for the correlation between the time spent and the initial and the final. So for this, we used a, a Gaussian copula to sort of uh, you know, define the, the relationship and how to sample this is pretty straightforward, but we could discuss this in the Q&A later. However, there's one thing to note here because when you initially sample, right, it's possible that the minimum final SOC and the initial SOC of the vehicle may, okay, may, not, may not really represent reality because you know, okay, when a vehicle turns up to a charging station, they turn up there to have the vehicle charged, right? So you would expect that they will request a higher SOC than their initial SOC, that's one. So which means when you sample in these cases, you know, you should, you know, you should make sure that the minimum final SOC is greater. However, because sometimes people turn up to sites to sell energy from their vehicle, in these cases, their minimum final SOC requested should be less than their initial SOC because they want to sell what's in their battery, okay? And this also has to be accounted for, but this depends on the probability that the vehicle wants to sell energy to the site. Yeah, so this flow chart is, 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 is the, well, sort of describes the vehicle assignment to charge points, okay? So, because what we actually doing here is trying to replicate the behavior of, of the site or the operation of the site. So when a vehicle turns up, it has to be assigned to a charge point. However, this assignment depends on a whole lot of factors, right? It depends on uh, driver preference and the number of available charge points. I also do not have the intention to go through this, but I just want to highlight a, a, few, a few things. So the first scenario is the vehicle wants to, um, the vehicle wants to DC charge and they are interested in V2G, meaning they're interested in having their vehicle used to power the grid or, or something. So in this case, they can only be assigned to V2G charge points. The second scenario is they, want to DC charge, but they're not interested in V2G. In this case, they get assigned to only DC capable charge points, but not V2G because we want to maximize the use of V2G. And in the third scenario, they want to charge AC. Okay, so these are the three scenarios. However, in each case, we try to match the vehicle to more as close as possible to the charge point with the closest capacity to what the vehicle wants. Because again, you want to maximize, uh, you don't want to use a, say a five, say a 50 kilowatt charger for a vehicle that requires maybe 3.7, you know, that's, that, that's waste. Okay, so once the vehicle is assigned to a charge point, then the model, can sort of obtain its charging parameters. So this means battery size, charging uh, uh, initial sets of the, just those things required to schedule its, 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 its charging. However, there are times when the vehicle owner, right, is, does not want to take an alternative charger. Say if they want to DC charge and you don't have a DC charger, they would leave the site. So in this case, we assume the, the algorithm will just assume that the vehicle leaves the site. However, if they don't mind that at all, okay, they, they, even if their preferred charger is not there, they can charge from any charge point, then the model assigns the vehicle to any charge point with capacity closest to its charging rate. Okay, so, that's the that's that's about the charging uh, charge point assignment. I'll just breeze through this, really, because as I said earlier, right? We want to replicate 
the 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 operation of the site. Okay, so we want to generate uh, you know the number of vehicles coming to the site, assign these, but we also want to calculate the flow, the optimal flow of electricity or of, of power on the site. And for this, we need to convert the physical model of the system to a mathematical model. So what you see here is the mathematical model of the system. The arrows here just show I mean, the, the possible flow of, uh, of power, okay? I just want to highlight a few, a few things. You can see that the, there are two battery nodes, right? So we have the battery injection and battery, battery load, okay? But in actual sense, we have only one battery at the site. The reason for this is that the battery can both serve as a power source during discharge and a load during charging. So that's why they are separated. Likewise, the grid has been separated into, into a load and, and a source. So during grid import, that's when the site is, uh, is importing electricity from the grid, it's a source. But when it's exporting, say, excess PV, I mean, solar, energy, then it's, it's, it's a source. I mean, it's, it's a sink. We use the same approach for V2G charge points. These are vehicle to grid charge points. Okay, so once the model is developed, the Mavica model is developed, the energy management algorithm sort of, right, distributes power flow on the site but it does this subject to four objectives. So the first is maximizing the daily net revenue generated. The second is charging every vehicle to its desired level. So this, we define this as driver satisfaction, okay? And the third, the third is satisfying the hydrogen and local site demands because there are hydro, there's hydrogen and there, is, there are local loads and these need to be satisfied. And the fourth is preserving the lives of the site and the vehicle battery. Because as I said earlier, the life of the VAP of, of any battery depends on uh, the number of charge and discharge cycles we put them through. So, but how does the EMS achieve this? Okay, it achieves this via you know, five, main, uh, five main events really. So the first is varying the charge and discharge rates of electric vehicles varying the charge and discharge rates of the site battery, scheduling the hydrogen generation and consumption. Say, for example, if it's okay, I would wait until when the sun is high or solar energy generation is maximum before we, we generate hydrogen, okay? So that's why, or shifting the local AC and DC demand. So load shifting is one way, it's one option for demand side management, okay? Or varying the levels of grid imports and next, so these are some steps. But the purpose of the energy management problem is just to compute the, the optimal power flow that meets these objectives. So this is the schematic or the layout, I would say, or the architecture of the energy management problem, okay? So the objective function we have used here is just the net revenue, okay? So we have, uh, we have defined these other objectives as constraints easily. So there's only one objective in actual sense, okay? So the daily net revenue, I mean, the daily revenue, because the net revenue is just uh, revenue versus, I mean, minus cost. There are four streams, as you can see here, the EV charging revenue, grid export, how much you make from selling energy to the grid, hydrogen generation and local site loads, then the daily cost has three streams, V2G reward. This means, say, when, when a vehicle, right, is used or is discharged, the, the driver needs to be rewarded adequately. Battery leasing, so this is what I was talking about. So if you, leave the, if you lease the battery, then this is important. If not, then this becomes zero. Green import, this is an electricity we buy from the grid. Then the decision variables, these are really what we vary in the problem. We want the power injected by each charge point 
and the power injected into each charge point. So this digital V2G injection. These other variables are self-explanatory, but the slack variable actually is because the objective function is initially non-linear. So what we did, we did was to linearize it, we introduced a slack variable. So this slack variable has its own, uh, well, I'll discuss the, I'll discuss its, its, its constraints later, but that's what this variable uh, <clears throat> um, represents. And we have a number of integers. So it's, it's more or less a mixed integer linear programming uh, problem. Then the constraints, we have you know, six sets of uh, constraints. The node power flow here is you know, just, just, it's really about say flow conservation or capacity constraints. The EV charge discharge constraint, this is, you know, this is actually a set of constraints that relates to say for 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 example, we want to charge every vehicle to what their driver requests, right? So if the driver wants eighty percent, so we make sure that the energy management delivers that. That's just an example. Or say if the driver does not want their vehicle to be cycled for more than two cycles, then that's you know we also consider that in the EV charge discharge constraints. We have the site battery charge discharge constraint, which is also similar to the EV battery charge discharge constraints. We have the local load shifting. So what this does is that the energy management, even if the energy management shifts the load, it makes sure that no load is destroyed. Okay, that at the end of the day, the site is still able to satisfy the, the demand. The hydrogen generation constraint, as well as you know, is related to meeting the hydrogen demand. And then we have a slack variable constraint, which is the constraint just placed on this slack variable. Okay, good. So we apply this to a simple uh, case study, which is actually fictitious here. Okay, so the site is in New Newcastle. Yeah, this is Newcastle. So the site has, of course, a two megawatt solar car port, okay? And it has 12 rapid chargers, six fast, okay, what we mean by six fast rapid here means that the AC capacity can be classified as fast and the DC can be classified as rapid, okay? And the sites should meet at least 5% of the energy needs of the hydrogen generation plant. So the goal here was to investigate the impact of a cap on vehicle stay on the financial viability of the site. Okay, so this is the profile for the number of vehicles arriving on the site. And as you can see here, well, this was just really a rough, well, an, an assumed profile. Okay, but as you can see here, it means that most of the vehicles are out, say maybe for a delivery during the day. Uh, this is the, the PV yield as a percentage of the installed PV capacity at the site, which is not quite high because it's about 27 or something percent maximum. This is the tariff for grid exports. So whenever the site sells energy to the site, this is how much it makes. So we have assumed just, just a flat one. And this is grid import, how much the site is charged for importing electricity from the grid. This looks like an economy seven, so low, off peak and high peak, okay? So what we did was we analyzed the site for uh, say five different caps. The first cap was two hours, four, six, eight, 24 hours. Well, 24 hours just means there was no cap because as I said earlier, we're looking at the daily operation. So the mission time you say is 24. So if the cap is, so there was no cap. So you can see that the, the we use, I think we used 250 samples. So the, the uncertainty is very low. And what we, we did was to ensure like uh, a comparison of controlled and uncontrolled charging. What we did was we used the same vehicle history. So if we, so like when we generated the, 
the vehicle history for say control chart and we use the same uh, history for control so we can compare. Okay, so this table just gives you sort of the average. Okay, so the, the average values for, for some key parameters you can see here. But the important thing I want to draw your attention to here is that it, you can see that one, V2G injection was negligible, right? So we did not really discharge most of the vehicles there. And secondly, you can see that uh, above six hours, there was really no, no difference in, in the performance of the site. And what this says clearly is that most of the vehicles really, even if there was no cap, would have left the site actually after six hours. So that's what that means. Also, this is the annual injection per year uh, source, so we've used PV, V2G, and grid. Of course, you can see that the PV injection is constant, and of course, that's what it should be because it does not depend on charging strategy, and you want to use all the PV generated, so that's, that's as expected. But you can see that the grid and V2G, of course, is negligible. The grid import you can see that again, above six hours, of course, there's no difference, okay? But below six hours, it increases as the, as the cap reduces. And the only reason here is that the number of vehicles being, being charged increases. So you, you sort of use more electricity from the grid because the PV system cannot uh, meet all of that demand. But most importantly, you can see that you use more energy for uncontrolled charging than controlled charging. And again, that is expected, right? Because uncontrolled charging, you're, you're not really, you have no control, you're not really controlling uh, when to charge or discharge the side vehicles, right? As they come, you charge them as, at maximum. So you don't even, you, you don't really care, uh, you know, when, what time of the day it is. So that is also expected. And this is the annual energy consumption, again, per, per source. So, you know, losses, hydrogen export. Again, the key here is above six hours, there's really not much difference, which, which corresponds to the, uh, the, the original uh, assumption. This is the, net revenue over the 25 25-year 25 uh, you know life site life of the site and again you can see it, uh, the trend is is the same control charging of course is is is, is better financially okay this is the this is actually how the net revenue changes, right? How the net revenue changes through the life of the project. You can see that it, you know, it reduces and this is just due to inflation really and, and nothing else. And you can see here that uh, above six hours, it's the same behavior and control charging is still better than uncontrolled charging. This is the, re net present value and the same trend, of course. Uh, this is the payback period. And here we, we've, we've, we've actually reported the range, so minimum, maximum. And that's what uh, Monte Carlo gives you because you know, it gives you that flexibility to, to really, as long as you are, more, you are simulating the entire performance of the site, so you can, you can get whatever result you want, and that's actually the purpose of you know showing these different uh, results, so you can investigate whatever you want to. And this is just the the uh, the how do I call this the daily variation of selected quantities, the electric vehicle load, 
the battery injection, hydrogen, and local low sites. Again, I you can see that. So I've used this is when there is no when there is no cap, okay, and you can see that clearly with uncontrolled charging, right? You you know the peak load is really high. And what this means is that you might need larger hardware, right? And you know a, a larger grid connection uh, capacity. Okay, for uncontrolled ch charging, you see that you know the it, it tries to reduce the peak and shift them to the day when PV generation is high, and at night when it's cheaper, right? To to buy electricity okay you can see that it does the same thing with hydrogen generation hydrogen generation peaks of course during the day okay so this is for the two hour cap okay and uh we used two hour and too far because from the previous results they are at the extreme the, the worst and the best you can see that for the two hour cap you know this is an interesting plot you see that the grid input actually oscillates, right? And the period is almost two hours because you know that's that's how long vehicles stay. But what this means is that the demand on on the site and on, on the grid increases considerably, even with controlled charging. You could see that it's still oscillating and it's still higher than what we what we had for for 24 hours. Okay, the hydrogen generation you can see reduced a bit more, two hours here more. I mean, more than two kg here. It's the, the peak is two, and that means, of course, the site prioritized uh, vehicle charging because vehicles return. I think 18, 18 p per per kilowatt hour, whereas the hydrogen was ten p. Right, so you can actually see that the, the energy management is actually doing its job. Okay, so this is just trying to show exactly the impact of, you know, of, of a cap on driver satisfaction, okay? So the, what this is showing is that is, uh, this plot is like the real time plot of the storage capacity at, one charge point. This was just a selected charge point. Okay, the red diamonds show the state of charge required by the departing vehicle. Okay, so these just represent a vehicle departing and another arriving. Okay, so if the green is above this, then it means that the the driver's expectation was superseded. Okay, so for 24 hours cap, you can see that even with, with a fast charger, each driver's, so here we, we're looking at five vehicles, each, each driver's uh, expectation was superseded, so which is fine, which is what you really want, driver satisfaction. Whereas uh, for two hours, for a rapid charger, you can see that's fine because of course, most rapid chargers will charge most vehicles, to full charge on that, you know, 45 minutes or one hour. So that's still fine. Well, but then for a fast charger, it's a, it's a different story altogether because you see that one or two drivers left, right? With a state of charge far, far, far below what they wanted, which means even though financially a, a, a lower cap is good, right? But you may be really uh, making your drivers very much unhappy. Okay, so to summarize, okay, smart homes are an emerging technology with the potential to address the range anxiety and grid capacity issues associated with the electric vehicle revolution. Okay, and you can use them to maintain grid stability. And obviously they help decarbonize the transport and energy sectors. Okay. So sort of they sort of aid our race to net zero. However, their operation is characterized by uncertainties and dependencies. Okay. Regardless, right, in spite of these uncertainties and you know, these complexities, 
we the operator needs to maximize the financial viability, driver satisfaction, and reduce the reliance of the system on the grid, okay, which is no easy task at all. Okay. So what we did was we have sort of proposed a framework that provides a means for modeling, because if you're able to model this system, right, and all its dynamic attributes, then you're able to investigate a whole lot, lot of scenarios, which can definitely help uh, in your decision making, okay? So, of course, <laughs> there are limitations to the framework because it's Monte Carlo based, it's computationally expensive, but you don't, you don't have, you don't need days anyway to, to run a full model. And with cloud computing and high performance comp computing in general, this should be fine. We have used the, the ahead planning, which is not always the case. Maybe for a fleet management site or an office, you may be able to tell exactly how many vehicles will be arriving the next day. But for say service stations, shopping centers, that will be challenging. But for planning purposes, of course, and comparing strategies, this is still not bad. Most importantly, the framework does not consider participation in the energy market, which is another big area, but actually uh, we will look at in future modifications to the framework. Thanks for listening and for, you know, for, for actually bearing with me because I, I overran a bit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Inslow. Uh, yes. Fascinating presentation. Um, and I think I can draw a lot of parallels to vertical farming with regards to needing a DC supply versus AC and things. So there's a lot of inspirational mm. parts of your talk that I feel like it can kind of cross apply to my own work, my own presentations as well. Oh, that's good. So thank you for that. And uh, really relevant at the moment, obviously, with the petrol crisis that we're having at the moment, uh, we would like electrical vehicles to be an alternative. But until we address this problem, then it's difficult to actually have a, an alternative. So yes. thank you, really important work. Um, does anyone have any questions for, for Hindelow? Yes. I know uh, Adolphus has his, his hand raised, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you so much, Francis. And uh, Hindelow, thank you so much for your interesting discussion. I really enjoyed today's topic. And, uh, you know, I really, really like, like uh, what's being discussed here today. And uh, one thing that I, I uh, one question, this is a very simple one that I have, is basically uh, when you talk about modeling the correlation and you use a Gaussian copula, uh, I believe. And uh, I was wondering, like, like, you know, because there are many, many copula models that can be used to, like, model the, uh, the correlation. But why specifically Gaussian copula? I mean, it is, I know it's the I, common choice, but... I know, yeah. I know, I know, I know. Well, you see, it's... Okay, one thing to to actually say it's it's normally it's it's hard to choose a copula, right? Yeah. <laughs> and and what people do in, in practice is really just try, you know, say in the in the absence of a benchmark, try yeah. several copulas and see which one best really represents what they're doing. So in our case, we use Gaussian because it's right, it's it's sort of when I do, I don't say benchmark, but it's been used for similar problems right. before. Yeah, so we just thought it was the go-to, go-to uh, copula. But the the good thing about the framework is, of course, as you would know, it's it's not it's not data specific or something. So the copula is just an input, right? So mm. because you have to characterize these uncertainties externally first and you know, and pass them as, as, as input. So if you pass any copula, yeah. so assuming you've, you've done some statistical analysis, maybe lo lots of data, you really are sure that maybe it's, it's, you should use another copula, then that's fine. It won't, it won't really matter much. Mm -hmm. The model will still be applicable, sort of. But I reckon in this case, uh, because how many samples you're using again? If you remind, if you remind us, two hundred and fifty samples. That's what we use for this case study. 
Right, and uh, how long did it take to simulate each again? Okay, now I need to check that. So, okay, so what, okay, so I think it was 3.92, that's the average, right? So mm. that's the average, it was 3.92 seconds. So it's not like, it's, it's not really, you don't need an hour glass. However, uh, but, 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 but that's just, that was just for one day, okay? So, ah, okay. Yeah, one day. Okay, so that was 3.92. But if you're doing this now, you are doing the full analysis, say for 25 years, of course, mm. then it might become an issue. But of course, if you have a parallel calls and you know a high performance computer, then it should be fine. Because I run this on a simple, on a, I think on a Mac group. Mm -hmm. so, mm. Right. Yeah, thank you so much for your insight and uh, your clear uh, response to the question. I mean, uh, yeah, it's just mainly the coupler that I was more concerned with. But thank you so much, nonetheless, for your presentation once again. It was really interesting. Welcome. Have we got any more questions for, for Hindalo from the audience? If not, whilst they're, they're thinking. Um, I guess uh, another question similar to Adolphus as well was when you were forming those beta distributions, um, obviously these sort of parameters that you're identifying are probably different depending on the different locations and the technologies that people are using. Is it, uh, do you, because I have this problem myself in my research because there's such scarce data, are you just kind of giving your best guess, like you say, from examples in the literature that have similar sort of ways of approximating or? Okay, yeah, that's, that's an important question. And actually, because, there's there's a lot of scarcity, right? Mm. In, you know, because it's sort of a new a new concept. Yeah. Even normal electric charging, you know, you don't have much data. Right. Like, exactly the same like, in my situation uh, as well. Right. So so what we did actually with this model first was okay because the goal actually of the work was to develop a framework, mm. okay, a framework that was not data centric. But that was mm. more about procedures, okay? And so, yeah. so I just want to uh, address that first. So the goal was to identify which parameters, of course, would, mm. would affect the performance of the site, okay? And what possible interactions you have to look for in these parameters. In fact, like if you look at the grouping, right, we have just grouped, you know, based on hybrid, like, the type mm. or the or the charging rate, but for some uh, use cases, you might even need more clusters, right? Let's mm. say you have a site that you know, that's that's not too far from a motorway, okay? So you could have two type of con customers, customers that are maybe subscribed to your site that don't live far away. And customers that maybe are driving to London and are just popping in. Okay. So you have very little information about their preferences, their behavior, right? So it's a little different. So you 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 would want to place those in in a separate cluster. Okay. But mm -hmm. now to come to your question. So what we, for the particular use cases like saying beta, gamma, was actually based on two. One was convenience, and two really was based on benchmarks and uh, based on our, our assessment of the properties in, mm. in, in question, like say the number of vehicles arriving or, or the number of charge mm. points. This is something you know that it's, you know, can best be, be modeled right. by, yeah. by by a, a poisson, right? Mm. So, so that so it's really a collection of you know benchmarks and personal assessment based on the characteristics. Yeah, yeah. But the key is, of course, in fact, in fact we we sort of discussed this in the in the discussion section of the paper. It's not published yet. Yeah. Uh, is that the models and, and well the probability distributions, the copulas were really just uh, recommendations, right? Mm. Educated recommendations based on, uh, as I said, benchmark and yeah. what we think.
Okay. Yeah. However, you know, if you have sufficient data, you can actually try to fit the actual distribution. Yeah. Absolutely. To the, yeah. To the data, and you you can pass. Let's say instead of gamma, it's log normal. You can pass the log normal distribution, yeah. but the underlying model won't won't change because all we need to do with those distributions is just sample from them. So if you so if you pass a gamma distribution object or a binary, or let's say a log normal or white pool distribution object, the model will just sample mm. sample them anyway. Yeah. Yeah, but it was just like guidance, of course. Okay, thanks for making that clear, because um, this is a problem that I've really struggled in the kind of indoor agriculture sector. There's such an absence of data. There's no benchmarking. Yeah. And um, I feel like your answer sums up it. You said it better than I have. I almost think I should take you to my Viva and you can say this when people ask me the same question. Um, but yeah, the, yeah. The, but I've hard. had to give educated guesses and I yes. provide more of a framework, but a lot yes. of people always ask me about the specific data. It, um, exactly. I think, I think that's actually the key, right? Even just for general modeling, it's always best, unless you know for sure how mm. some parameter is going to behave, yeah. right? If not, it's always good to really provide that framework that yeah. lets people right. do what they want to do. Okay, so yes, yeah, so with 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 time as they get more data and yeah. they are really clear on 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 certain things, then it's fine. And for our work here, the the key here was that people have not thought about this before. For right in the framework of a of a smart hub, right? Like to list mm. exactly what needs to be looked at. Okay, what uncertainties, what interactions, right? So yeah, yeah. The, the, personally, the way that I've tried to get around it is by not assuming the distributions necessarily, but using p boxes to try exactly. and capture where the uh, where you're uncertain about the distribution itself to yeah. try and compensate. That yeah. people could fill in with gaps as we collect more data. Exactly. But, um, exactly. That's 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 one way, right? That's that's good. But like in the case of the copula, it'll be it'll be really hard. Yeah, I can imagine. Absolutely. Yeah, because you have to know the underlying distribution, right? Be, be, at least the marginal distributions before, because yeah. then then you can't sample. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's really thorough. Yeah. Mm. Um, I think we have time for one more question. I know Konal has his, his hand raised. Would you like to ask a question, Konal? Oh, yeah. yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, was this a, a generic model or is this developed with a specific site or application in mind? No, okay, it's a generic model, but it's developed specifically for smart hubs. Okay, you can have variations of that smart hub. Okay, so you can even have a site without electric vehicle charging stations. Okay, okay. okay. yes, and, and the good thing about the model in that case is you really won't have to go into the model to change anything. You just change the input. Say you won't, you won't define any a charging station so there'll be zero charging stations and in that case it won't does that answer your question yes yes it's got a very broad yes uh, applicability uh, yes exactly it, yes in fact even the 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 energy management algorithm actually you can you can apply that to most smart smart systems that you know that that are using renewable energy because all you have to do, as I said, is if a, if a certain parameter is not important, then you set it to zero, or yeah, you know, or or so. Then it won't it won't it won't count at all. Great. Right. Thanks. Uh, have we got any more questions from the audience? I know Scott has also joined us, but I presume he kind of tuned in at the tail end. Um, if if not, then we'll wrap up the talk and thank our speaker and then we can stop recording and just have a little chat. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Hindelo, for your talk again. I, I'm sure I speak on behalf of the whole institute. 
when it's just great to see you and to learn what more about your your work in electrical vehicle charging um like i said many parallels can be drawn upon other people's research and i, I think uh, it was really really nice to 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 see it so thank, thank you, you.